the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Hawaiian volcano update today, Thursday, January 20th, 2022. Uh, I'm showing you guys uh, one of the images released by the USGS yesterday of a view about at eye level with that lava lake, and for you guys to enjoy there as we open our broadcast here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Kilauea mostly, a little bit about Mauna Loa. Um, we're going to save some USGS presentations for next week. But we will uh, try to try to incorporate your questions um, from the chat and um, after after our main segment here to uh, in our discussion of what's happening with the volcano. So let us know if you have any any questions. Let us know if you have any issues with the audio or the video. Dana will be monitoring the chat for that. And uh, here we go. Uh, so that's that view from eye level because the geologists had to go down into the crater and and check out that view. But uh, the first thing I want to show you guys today is this. This uh, graph that's announcing this newest value of total for the eruption so far at 45 million cubic meters or 12 billion gallons was in today's update from the USGS. So, and red is our eruption um, here, and blue is that eruption that began in December 2020 and went through May. And so, in comparison to the last eruption, which lasted five months, this current eruption uh, has now exceeded the total output and has done so one month sooner than the last one, right? So we started off not quite as fast and have actually maintained a higher rate for longer with some little variations here. Right? But that's the, the big news is that we actually have a, a higher uh, output of total 
And if you look at the steepness of this line over here, the steepness of it is giving us the rate of change and a little bit faster than you see in the past month here. In the past month, we, we took, it took us from 33 to 30, 38, that's 5 million cubic meters, took us about a month for that to happen. And here, since the turning of the new year, it only took two weeks for that to happen. I'm sorry, right here, this last 5 million right here. So um, it's still coming out at a fairly low rate. It's not any threat to anyone. Um, but it is filling the, the, the crater uh, uh, still uh, at, a, at a good rate, and that is maybe a little surprising because the main news we've had for the past few weeks has been all the pauses occurring in the West Vent. And so this is a live view into the V1 camera in the West Vent, hosted by the USGS. And looking at the monitors, it looks like the, the volcano is deflating, and we're expecting uh, another pause to begin um, tonight. And perhaps this is the, the beginning of that here. So we don't quite see a lot of the west vent behind this fume, but you see a little bit of this lava pond, this west pond of the lava lake, and there's a little bit of an inlet that comes in right through here, and it's crusting over and not super active right now at, at current time. And so let's rewind it and play back um, here. Uh, this is the time lapse uh, that Dane assembled um, from capturing this USGS webcam um, going back over the last week here. So. There it is. You can see a lot of that circulation of lava. There's our first pause that occurred midweek. That was really the only pause, pause besides the one we have starting now. And then you see the lava comes back, reoccupying the west vent. It leaks out through some of these cracks right through here and then over top of the ground through here as well. So let me rewind that, see if I can catch one of those frames here. Maybe this one, right? This is something I thought was really interesting. Zoom it in right there. And this is the west vent up here on the top right of the image. And here's that crack, that, are, that kind of upward extension of that fissure. And here is that west pond area right there. You can see it looks like it's pouring out of that crack and falling in. Wow, if, we, if I play this video at the same time, this gets pushed up from below us, right? So it's really filling this whole crack. It's like a big blade going that way, going that way, that blade. And it's, it's filling from below and coming up where it can and then pouring out any which way to get to the lowest possible spot up here. So that's what's happening over there at the, at the west vent of this eruption. Let's switch views here to the S1 camera and let's play you guys a time lapse for the last. Um, where are we at now? Look at this here. This is the last week as well. So viewed from the south, this is S1 camera. There is that west vent area right there, and that west pond is right there. So that's the area that has persistent lava overturning even during the pauses. Where's this larger? Uh, pond area over here is essentially taking the overflow of that of that overturning deeper area, right? So it seems like the, the deeper connection is right down in here, and this stuff is all kind of a, sh a shallow surface that, that cycles through, right? It kind of pours out through here, and somehow it's got a way to to get back underneath a crest here at the edge and join all the lava that's underneath this crest, because really the story of all that lava filling in at that higher rate, it's coming in underneath all this crust uh, more so than just out of that little hole there. So it's really that whole crust that's lifting up, and we'll have to switch to the next camera to see that. But uh, here's a view of the S1 camera within the last half an hour. And you can see that we don't have quite as much of that larger area with active lava. It, there still is some. You can see it's it's uh, overturning in sheets, but the level has dropped a little bit, and there's one big channel pouring into it right here. And this will be easier to see when we look, look at some of the photographs coming up here shortly. So that's the current S1 view. And finally, we'll look at the time lapse of the F1 thermal camera. Right? The, the west vent is now over here. It's got this little glowing spot on top. And uh, this is our west pond. That's that larger lava lake area. And it turns out that very recently, and, and before this most recent deflation today, the lava was also coming underneath the crust this way and popping up, oozing up along the edge of the crater wall and that hardened lava surface cap that's over top of the whole lava lake, right? So, I mean, the area that you're seeing is red here is not just the, the, the active lava. The active lava goes all the way underneath this crust, all the way to there, all like that. And this, you're just seeing it hottest, what's exposed at the surface right there. Let me rewind this. And let's play it back from about a week ago when lava was also uh, had been going underneath this crust and erupting over here on this down drop block to the northeast and has just started started decreasing started here 
from in the mid of that last pause until it bursts back forth. During that reoccupation, you can see it, it overflows a cone. While it's steadily erupting out, you can see it move to this west, I'm sorry, to this uh, left area, which is the north actually. Here's our second pause coming in on the 16th, 17th, and on the 18th, I believe, it comes back forth. There it is. And not quite a, a, as big of an output from the side of the vent over here, but you can see afterwards following, we see that burst up of this ooze up here to the north. This is on the northwest side of the cone. North arrow would be that way. Yes, I have confused you by this point. All right. Current view of the F1 camera. This is from half an hour ago. Here's that one channel. And you can see still hot, but not as active. Oh, not as active a lava surface here. Um, all the way to the edges, right? It seems like it's dropped down a little bit there. So to look at this a little more closely, we'll look at the most recently released photos and uh, from the USGS here that were released yesterday, and this goes back to a couple of days ago. So, <coughs> excuse me. So. Back on January 18th, two days ago, they saw a similar pattern where the lava was was at a lower level before it was refilling. Right, this is actually actually on a different point of the trend. This is when it's coming back in, and we think we're seeing it right now going back out. But this photograph is a little bit better resolution than, than what we can see through the webcam. So I'll zoom it in for you guys. There is that West Pit pond, the West Pond, the West Vent over here, and the channel coming in. You can see here this white arrow is pointed to this upper edge of the ledge. Now you can see there's several different layers in here. The lava is filling this area that looks kind of like a canyon when it drains, and then it refills back up. And fast forward to an hour and 15 minutes later, and you can see that same arrow right there with the lava having filled all the way up to that ledge and being more active um, all the way across, even though it looks more silvery in the daytime here, why we often use a thermal as well. So that's the comparison there. Um, and that was in a, when it was coming in, and you can see that you really don't see that channel pattern anymore, right? It's really like surging out and it's spreading out in every direction from there, not just a single channel as we see up here, and as we see it right now as well. Come back to our F1 camera. All right, let's look at some more pictures here. Uh, during that lowered area, you can see. Uh, the edges of this of this lower part where the lava is filling in here, and um, this one here is zoomed in. Let's let's see what it says here. Um, new lava is encroaching in the center, center left portion of the image, so it seems like this is the the edge that's perhaps where the lava is coming towards and circulating back in. It's hard to tell from just that zoomed in view, but the silvery stuff over here is the more active lava all through here, all through, all through there. And then this stuff here in the foreground that's darker is not as active, not as recently active. Interesting degassing rinds here on the edges of this lake. And views. Telephoto view looking in at that upwelled lava pond cascading in, right? So this is actually when it's surging up and filling up, this is now higher and it seems like it's flowing downhill into here, right? So it's really, we really had a shift from this being the main vent. The, it was really coming out of that same crack that's in this direction here. It's coming out of the ground through that pit now, more so. And this is more like the, the gas vent and the overflow valve over here for when it's surging back out. Okay. Zooming in here to this large island. Right, so yeah, this is what I thought we were looking at. These, these two edges right here, close to the island, where the lava, when it fills back in, it seems like it might circulate down. I see some, some caves in there, right? That's perhaps a path into that zone of froth or or the, finding some pathway into that area below that crest there. But the island itself is still standing tall here. You can see it's also still been rising um, with that whole lid um, as it has been ever since last year. All right, so last image from um, the late morning of the 18th here. And you can see, zoomed in on a west vent, the recent lava flow that overtopped the cone and poured out here to the, this is probably to the west, southwest. Um, you can see that this is an area that overflows, so does over here. 
but really it's coming out through that pathway that's that's that upper projection of the crack that runs in this direction and then really coming into this upwelling area over here. All right, so um, see a comment from from Nathan here um, saying that the the noticing that new bright area. I'm not sure which bright area he's talking about, but uh, uh, that area that's in this west pond um, was estimated to be about a hundred feet across. As far as the main lake surface area, that really hasn't changed when it's full uh, in between apposes, right? I think the new bright area is he's talking about on the thermal. The, the one that emerges in the uh, lower left. Oh, okay, okay, that one, yeah, along the this ooze up flow over here. Yeah, that, yeah, that ooze up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a that's it's pretty interesting, right? I mean, you imagine that the the center of this piston head um, is more, you know, is is moving without any friction or cumbrance by the wall, like a critter wall over here, right? So, and it may be that it's not not really uh, getting stuck at all, but really just rising and the diameter is increasing and causes that gap to occur as well. So. Yeah, it seems like this back area hasn't filled in as much. It hasn't been as easy. We haven't seen ooze ups in this area nearly as often as we have on this backside. Um, but it seems like it's like it's uh, leveling out though. Yeah. There have been quite a lot of flows that when this thing bursts forth, it often will flow in this direction as well here and that way as well. And that's often what's been filling this 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 channel, right? But it doesn't it doesn't um, get the lava quite as often. So yeah, good observation, Nathan Mahala for that insight. Okay, so come back to our pictures here and see when that west pond is full, how it looks. All right, back on the 14th, so not quite a week ago, uh, there was a UAS mission, a drone mission, at the summit of Kilauea. There is an image of the drone high above the crater lake. And you can see here's an image of them preparing the drone for takeoff um, near the webcams back here in the, in the background. Uh, this portable helipad. They are uh, attaching and um, adjusting these uh, one liter collection bags, uh, presumably gas collection bags here, so they can sample the gases. And here we get a more of a zoomed in view on that same west pond, right? So you can see how different points of its activity, it'll have more or less lava, right? So here you see the active lava surface is obviously more reddish. And over here, there's lava underneath this part, but it's not um, upwelling enough that it's keeping the whole surface open. It's starting to crust over on one part of it, which is what we're seeing in the webcam um, as we speak right now. Right, and really interesting little uh, topography over here. It looks like there's stuff trying to come downhill this way, but then this whole area will rise and fall, right, depending on lava pressure here. So it's really dynamic area right through here. Right over here is you can see that notch that that connects to that crack over to that west vent. And back to the thirteenth. So in the thirteenth. They had a special mission, a helicopter mission, down onto that down drop block uh, to the edge of a lava lake. And this is to rescue equipment um, that had actually survived the collapse of the volcano on this down drop block. But now that lava is coming in and um, overflowing onto that lowest block, it's encroaching upon that equipment. And so they went and pulled it out of there, which is fascinating, right? So. Here we actually have an image of a geologist in their orange flight suit um, right at the edge of this overflow area of the lava lake. So the actual um, deep part of the lava lake is further over, like over here perhaps, somewhere right in, somewhere in there. And it's been overflowing from that ooze up area onto this lowest block, and this block is goes like uphill this way, like a big ramp. That's how it, how they can be safely here. And your equipment is over here. You can see there's a housing, there's some solar panels, and we'll get better views of this and some of the upcoming imagery. But as a aside, that's also how we get the view towards the main part of the west vent back here and this lava lake um, past all this collapsible right in here. 
image we started off with, and we'll see again here shortly. So here's a closer view of this monitoring station. It says that this is more accurate to say it partially survived the 2018 collapse events at the summit. Um, but it was lowered by almost 500 feet in 2018. You can see here, this is the recent lava I'm getting pretty close here to it. Time to save some of your expensive equipment here. And there's what, the, what it looks like on the edge, right? You see more of this Pahoy Hoi flow texture, more of what you'd see down in Kalapana or um, Hole and Waiwakino's National Park down at the coast where lava is just flowing across the surface and not so much a lava lake texture, which is what you'd expect as it's flowing over top of this down drop block area over here. There's a nice panorama. There, right? There's a geologist edge of the lake right there, and the ramp, you can see it rising upwards that direction. And we can pan across. A little bit of the instrument over here on the bottom right, and a lot of the gas and the west vent back over here, a piece of this island sticking up. That is the zoomed in view there. And finally, they actually zoomed in with their camera and got us this image um, of the actual active lava surface there in the background with a west vent, as we started off sharing with us today. So those are the most recent images. Uh, we did skip images last week, so there's a few from last week that are interesting to look at, um, interesting patterns of the textures on the surface of the lava lake during those fuller times. Um, You see the lava lake when it's all the way full right, during the daytime, full west pit, and um, degassing flare bright spots on the, along the edges of the lake here. Often what happens is you see the like, area where the gas is bubbling up and you see these things kind of spattering and spattering and these, these points, will, it might start somewhere like over here and it might work its way across and then get recycled. These are fairly shallow bubble burst coming out through this, this hardening crust that you see forming. And um, I see your question, Mary, and I'll get to, hear, get to it here in a second. And then here is a close-up of some of those spatter bursts. Those are one of the cool things to look for if you're able to go to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and stand at a Koi Overlook. And they might just seem like little bright flare-up spots, but if you can get a good, good eyepiece to look through whether it's a camera or a telescope or what have you, then you, you can zoom in on those things. Here's another view of the west vent. This is going back uh, uh, last week already still, but it's very similar patterns. The geometry hasn't really changed. You can see in this, this image here, the lava coming from this gap area into that west pond area, and everything being fairly level across the surface here. It's flowing out into that main crater. So that's those are the images, and so let's come back here to a question um, about the housings for this gear. Yeah, so um, yeah, these are they are using regular coolers that are modified, right? They do obviously provide some insulation uh, for a lot of equipment here. Um, it's regular regular conditions of sun and rain, but yeah, the lava is. Pretty close, but not quite close enough, and we can't see the far side of this cooler. It might start to be sh showing some damage, perhaps, but um, yeah, it's uh, it looks like they got there just in time. We did have a question as well about the um, how hot it is in some of these areas where that uh, guy was standing in that photograph, and maybe talk about that a little bit, like some of the because you have all these different areas, right? You can be in one spot and it be pretty much normal and then you find a spot with some hot gas next to it coming through a crack or something like that so what are your thoughts yeah it, yeah it really is that right i mean these are almost like uh, like a surface flow areas in this part of the of the of the caldera right because it's flowing over that downtrap block and the flows are fairly shallow there i mean not very thick um whereas over the main crater floor if you were to stand let's say on that main island and find one of those vents on there you, you know might might get some some serious mm -hmm. heat coming off of there. Um, so I relate it to being high lava flows down in Kalapana area or in a national park. And yeah. um, you know, lava is obviously um, liquid, right? But um, standing 
you know, at a what five and a half, six feet above the the ground. Um, the temperature like on your face is usually you know, like, you know like less than a hundred degrees. It's, you, know, you feel the heat of it, but it's not like it's scalding if you're standing up. If you like crouch right. down and put your face near the lava, then you can start to get hotter than that and get your hair is, hair tips start to melt, kind of thing. And uh, we'll just talk about some of the stuff we saw in 2018. Some of those vents got pretty hot. Like um, we'd have all these other, all the the majority of vents, they'd be in a certain temperature range we'd see, but then we'd find some really hot spots out there that you wouldn't want to be anywhere near. Um, they're too hot to even steam, right? The, you can see the the moisture uh, being kept back by all the heat, even though it like had just rained or whatever. Um, so yeah, you can get some really hot spots, but lots of spots that aren't um, any different, really. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, wind direction is a major consideration. If you know, even in an area right. like that, like in that closed bowl, like if it was bad weather, you know, um, if it was mm -hmm. pouring rain, you'd probably get a whiteout right there, and that wouldn't be right. good. So if it's pouring rain, it probably would have postponed. Yeah, and that steam can. It doesn't have to be that hot to be scolding. Um, yeah, compared yeah. to just the hot air type of thing. And I think perhaps, you know, um, as importantly as not being able to see what's going on and where you're going and like, oh, yeah, hurt you that, you know, you're more likely to hurt yourself because you can't see where you're going. And that's that's more it to me, you know, and right. And me and you will casually say wide out conditions and wide out conditions on the mainland, you know, mean snow and all that out here. We mean, no, the, the, the steam is so thick, you can't see your own hands. Yeah. Type of thing. Yeah. So you can't, I mean, look at the ground, how, how bumpy the ground is, right? To try to walk without tripping on something, right? And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like you can, you can stand there and just steam yourself and cook. You have to, like, go somewhere, right? But you can't see where right. you're going, and you can't see what the ground is. And um, if you fall, then you, that's when you yeah. really escalate. That may be part of what happened with Sean King down in Kalana, 2018. Right. Similar whiteout condition. So that's why that's are serious things. Yep. So yeah, that's a little bit of a, you know, of a context of what, what, of what it's like. You know, it's actually a perfect area. Um, if I had been a geologist uh, at the USGS, I would have been eyeing on that overflow area to be a great place to go and sample the thing directly for the first time, right? You know, I'd be very surprised if someone didn't collect a sample while they were there at, at the edge of this thing. Because um, you, you have access to it for the first time. Of course, the higher it gets, the more access there will be. Yeah, that's uh, that's it. Um, yeah, even if the cooler melted, I suppose, uh, Marin, yeah, get a new cooler is all good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what can you do? All right, so let's look at some of the monitoring signals here. Um, the lava depth. Let me let me reload this so it gives us maybe a couple extra data points here. Right side, so. Our webcam is still looking similar here. Our lava depth is starting to drop. You can see here at the right side, this is the last one week. And if I scroll it up a little more, lava depth at the top and tilt at the bottom, you see these are still mirroring each other. Not exactly one for one. A little different areas, but pretty dang close, right? You can see that the inflation begins first. And then after some time, when it peaks, that's when lava surges out. That's when inflation turns around. So that's the, 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 the dynamics are interesting to note, note right here in this little window right here. Otherwise, following very similar patterns, right? And then decreases, stabilizes, and then that's when it starts dropping again. So here we are at the dropping section here, as we were about four days ago. You're looking at the last month, you can see that pattern here, and it's the right part of the graph. It began to be vis visible. Right there, around an eighth or so, and you can see that the range of change here. Let me scroll, scroll back up to look at this. Um, this is at around, around at three ten meters here on the left, and at the bottom here, it's at maybe two ninety eight more or less. Right, so you're looking at twelve meters, uh, thirty feet swing, 40, 40 feet swing more or less. Yeah, thirty five maybe. So that's the range of swings we're having here. Prior to that, we were having little surges that were a few meters tall. So we were likely uh, looking at the bank of that lava lake um, earlier here, right? And either the, the, the bank fell in and we now are part of that main deeper channel, or the laser was adjusted. I'm not sure exactly here. But in any case, we're now showing a different, a different signal marginally here, right? That more of the center of the lake rather than the margins of it. So you see correspondence here. And otherwise, just these peaks 
or is he showing up? Okay, going to the SO2 here. Um, the most recent measurement was 2,100 tons per day uh, yesterday. That's still in this range of two to 5,000. That's been typical uh, during active lava. And when we have pauses, we get measurements that are done in the hundreds in this in-between times. This is something that I've overlaid for you guys before, but uh, well, there has been a new talk released this week uh, by the USGS that goes into the gas a little more. So we will play the full talk with all the details uh, next week, but I wanted to pull out a couple of these slides from it just to show you guys here. This going back to the last last eruption that was um, uh, December 2020 to May 2021, having deflation inflation events also, and having gas measurements that also reflected that high during the inflationary points and low during the deflationary points. There is those data points. Or just maybe see the yellow on your screen. I'm trying to highlight, highlight with a little bit here. Low gas during deflation, right? Um, but you didn't see um, this up here is a plot of the SO2 emission rate, right? And I zoom in a little bit and explain, and she does this much better. I'm going to hurry it along here. We just have a log scale on the left side here, right? So this is 10, 100, 1,000, 1,000, just to get more of the detail of this low end of the graph here. So you can see that overall, a decrease. It decreased quickly, then stabilized, and decreasing more slowly. But even during this uh, inflation inflation time, right, and even if we go a little bit later here, you see the variation isn't that great among these data points right there. So the slide she showed for this ongoing era of pauses um, right here. Similar thing, right? Here's our, our recent tilt plot and Low gas during the deflation, and high ga gas during the inflation, and low gas during the deflation, and high gas during the inflation, and same pattern. Um, it's essentially a d different version of the same thing we guys. So the difference, though, has been um, something that's visible on this plot, right? So this is same thing: a log scale on the left, SO2 emission rate, and days since onset now. And like that that volume graph, um, we're now counting from days since eruption onset. So we can compare blue 2020 to the red of 2021. And you can see very similar patterns through time until right in here, where you start to see this wild variation of very low values during the pauses and then very high values during the, or just not very high, but higher than that previous 2020 frame right there. Right? So that's the the higher variation, the higher range that exists now that we're seeing swinging back and forth. And that's fascinating. I'm not sure exactly why. I'll love to hear more from them about that at some point. But that's the pattern that's visible right here, right? That despite um, similar deflation inflation events during the last eruption, we were not getting these wild swings um, in gas nearly as much as we are now, right? So similar patterns, but much larger range of swing now than we had before. That makes sense. Leave that one at that and we'll play that whole, whole thing in full next week but um, that means that the VOG forecast um, is harder to well the VOG is harder to forecast but uh, assuming a constant source you can see what the, where, where the winds would blow the VOG right so because uh, the gas output is relating to the pauses and if we're going to go into a pause now for example then for the next day there won't be as much gas coming out and so this vo void forecast will won't be as bad as it's being forecast to be. Surges back forth, it might be slightly wor worse, and so on. So that's that kind of pulsing effect of the gas coming out of the vent now, rather than the continuous source, which is slightly complicating here. But you can see that we're forecast to have uh, trade winds for those several next few days here, and Vog is going to the southwest, as it most often does, towards Pahala Ocean it's down there. All right, that's the little extra on the gas here, but we're gonna look at the earthquakes as well. And so let's do this little section on earthquakes. Um, that occurred mostly last week here. So this is a, the, the one month plot. You can see here at the right end, there's not quite as much. We had a couple little little bumps of one overall kind of peak. That's what I'm calling that earthquake activity that happened last week. There was actually one, one smaller one that began it to here. So looking at the last week, you can see that besides our usual 
Mahala earthquakes, our usual south flank earthquakes. The unusual thing here is the summit cluster. Um, unlike last week when most of these at the surface were yellow, we're starting to see some of these orange uh, shallower earthquakes in the summit now. But this, this is not easy to see from that map, so if I scroll down here and show you what's going to be a time along the x-axis and depth here along the, along the y, so this is zero. The very top is a surface above sea level. And most of what we want to see is squeezed into this between this zero and 10 range right in here, because 10, 20, 30, and so forth. But I'll try to blow it up as much as I can here. And this is going back to a week ago when this activity was going on. So here's that earthquake cluster um, in three pulses there, there, and there. Right? And we talked about uh, possibly it could be coming up a little bit, right? Maybe slightly coming up. Um, then, then from that point on, you see uh, a lot more of these orange ones. The, there's a couple big yellow ones right in here. If we scroll up, we can see that those big yellow ones are actually south flank earthquakes. So we'll have to ignore those. Uh, this is really the orange ones up here, this upper band. You can see that this lower band disappears, and now we, we resume this upper band. So if I zoom it back out, you can see that that's the pattern there. Like slightly more above here, compared to before. And all the lower ones have have uh, ceased or ceased flaring up there. So GPS-wise, no no obvious trend in our long-term patterns here. Nothing really we can scrutinize out of this. All kind of the same. Seismographs, we're keeping an eye on this because the trimmer is uh, decreasing. When we see a flat line, and we can anticipate that the gas is not coming out of the vent anymore. The lava is not coming out of the vent. But um, I wanted to get down to this one. This is the one month, last, whole last month of activity. See that whole cluster on there. But maybe more easily, if I zoom in here, you can see. Um, most of the last two weeks here, this is that, that earthquake cluster down here. It was depths of 10 to 15 kilometers, more or less. And you can see that um, now we have all this other stuff above is what's, is what's ongoing, right? That stuff you can see is perhaps a little bit more active than it's been at other times previously in the month. Like up here, right? You can see there's still a lot of earthquakes up here, but it's not nearly as dense. Is what we're seeing here recently. So you can see there's certainly some adjustment happening from the, those mid mid deep levels under the caldera to a little bit shallower levels right now. And if we look at the earthquake map here, we can see where these are. So there they are. If I look at this most recent depths, you know, 2.3 kilometers, 1.2 kilometers, 3.2 kilometers. There's one at 10. There's one at 10. Another one at 10, but there's quite a few that are under five kilometers now. So essentially we're seeing that, that migration of magma from that deeper area to this shallower area under the caldera here, right? Not continuously, it seems like there was you know one and then the other, right? So like a knock-on domino effect, so to speak. I can zoom it out some more so you can see how this fits in the, the pattern of the island there. There's that little cluster. Um otherwise you can see not a whole lot of uh Unusual activity there, right? S same going on around Mauna Loa, um, as was last week, weeks ago. Pahala, really similar, South Flank, Silva Slope. Okay, so a couple illustrations for to help with the earthquakes here. Um, this one showing depth in kilometers, right? So that depth, 10 to 15 kilometers, is down here, somewhere in this range. And that's around that same depth as that basal decolement fault, fault, the detachment fault. Right, and the, the rift zone has that upper shallow area of active transport, and we think there's a deep system that drives spreading. And you might at first associate that depth of 10, 15 kilometers with that area right there, right? And note that there is a deeper seismic zone under Kilauea down here, somewhere in the range of 30 to 40 kilometers down. So what I'll do is I'll switch to this earthquake stack plot here, right? So this upper panel is 0 to 5 kilometers. That's what this is. This one is 5 to 15. This one is 15 to 20, and this lower one here is 20 to 60. This lower one is showing that deep, deep seismic source right in there. You can see that as we get shallower, 15 to 20, it's really in a tight little conduit right there, and not a whole lot anywhere else. And then the range we're interested in is this one up here, this second layer down, 15 to 20 kilometers down. Um, 
maybe slightly shallower, maybe more, more in a 10 to 15, but somewhere in that range. And But I want to focus on this one because you really can see here south flank area down here. And you can see a bit of this summit area, but you can see there's a clear gap in between them right there. Right? So there's it's, it's a similar depth, but it's not exactly the same thing going on there. And coming up shallower, you can all gets closer together to the surface here. So to get a little bit more resolution on this, I'll show you guys one more image here. And this is taken from a paper by Wright and Klein in 2006, looking at this uh, deeper earthquakes under Kilauea. And so here on this left side is a outline of the caldera and lots of black dots showing all the earthquakes that they're plotting on a map view. It's not that diff different from what we're seeing today. They've used different shape symbols on this left side to indicate the depth, right? So that see the various different depths, but it's easier to me. Scroll to the right over here and focus in on, on this section right here, right? So this is essentially to the north and this is to the south. The line going through right there and through this, this crater. That's our, our section right there. And they're showing the area that has typical shallow earthquakes um, in that magma reservoir area. There's an area that is has not nearly as much seismicity. It's shown by this polygon right here. Right, and you remember everything's projected in from the sides and kind of compressed. So there's we're, we're losing some of the 3D aspect of it to, to, it, to it here, right? But there, you know, it's everything surrounding it. But there's an area of a seismic um, character here in the middle, and then below that we have this deeper cluster of earthquakes that seems to connect through, right? So it's it's not quite clear, you know, if this if this is exactly um, what kind of magma storage area, or perhaps it's like some of the olivine cumulates um, that co uh, collect below the magma chambers, magma reservoirs. Um, it's there could be all kinds of things going on in there that I I'm, I can't give you any better idea of right now, um, except to point out that those deeper earthquakes that we were seeing last week were in this area below that zone right here areas that we've seen before right and so there was something that was coming up and moving through that zone and we're now seeing things in the shallower zone then it might indicate some passage of magma through the system there and that's kind of a, the default explanation for um, those earthquake earthquakes that we're seeing there that earthquake pattern we saw so it'd be interesting to see if that leads to anything um, different at the surface right it hasn't quite propagated its way through and up right it seems that this is a days weeks long process um, so perhaps in the next week we'll see something different at the surface, perhaps we won't, it's hard to tell exactly um, if that will relate or not, or if it'll lead to some subsurface change. Or... So that's, the, that's a little bit more in the earthquakes. And um, while I'm still on Kilauea here, um, let's see, the question about the pauses. Um, the pauses, are the pauses a long-term trend? So the pauses began, um, there were a couple that happened in, in November, um, but really it, it, they began at the start of December is when, when they've been coming, coming in full. And pauses are something that, has, that occur in every eruption of Kilauea, just about. I want to say that pool eruption had something like um, more, than, more than 50 pauses, something like that, right? 40 to 50 pauses, somewhere in that range. So um, we might be in the teens here. Um, we're not quite to that that high level, right? Um, if eruption goes on long enough, it'll have, maybe have a chance. But uh, that's it's more of the dynamics of the gas coming out of the volcano um, than it is about the magma coming into it. So the, the deeper supply is, we would imagine, fairly steady. And it's more about how it's able to, to vent at the top. And uh, you know, we've, we've pointed out that it's different from the five minute eruption, eruption that, that ended in May. It's hard and harder to know why it's that different, right? We can point out what else is different as well, that there's a lot more lava in the crater. Um, the, the eruption is coming up through the lava lake now, and it's not feeding in from above. That could be something significant that's changed. Um, the, the actual volume of, of lava in the crater of Halemaumau is increased, so that its weight Right, the volume and the weight is all increased, so there's there's more pressure above it, right? So the whole dynamics of pressure are changing as the as the magma is coming to the surface and emplacing crater as lava. So those are some of the, the the things to consider there that we can discuss. Um, 
away the USGS's insight when I can share some more with us. Okay, and let's see, I see one more question on Kilauea, and a question is about the trail to Twin Peaks by Kilauea, and, and the question is, is there still widening and deepening in the cracks in the ground? Um, Twin Peaks, uh, is that referring to uh, uh, on the southwest rip zone, or is that, I'm not, I'm, that, that's not a term that I'm very familiar with there. So maybe Dan can help me out on that here. Um, but um, let's see. We do know the south flank is still moving, right? And that the cracks are still, you know, cracks opening is something that is normal to happen from the flank moving. But also you see that in areas like Kilauiki, where you just have contra contraction of a long-term lava lake and the crest kind of pulls and contracts and pulls apart. And you get cracks that open um, out along that crater in the National Park as well. There is a Twin Peaks on Kauai. I wonder if that's what he's talking about. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you if you're hearing us, Brenda. Maybe you can clarify it, and we can come back to your question here. Yeah. But for now, yeah, what I'm, I'm not sure. What I want to do is switch gears to Mauna Loa real quick. Um. Real quick, because on Mauna Loa, earthquake rates have dropped back down from what they were. It seemed like they were slightly elevated here for the past few months, slightly. But now they're back down to really nothing. Um, nothing abnormal. Here is our cross caldera GPS distance across the summit, and you can see that after this is what it was was in action last year, and fairly stable, and then started increasing sometime September, October, and most recently here at the right, it looks like it it's either going down or on average it's flat, and you can see it's quite a lot of quite a lot of spread and scatter in these data here, so it's uh, hesitant to say that it's going down, you know. Um, long term right but you can certainly see that it doesn't seem like it's it's clearly not rising um like it was so it seems like it's gone quiet there as well and not a lot going on mauna loa the tilt is pretty flat as well the blue line is the radial and it's decreasing ever so slightly but at a much slower rate than we saw in previous months whatever adjustment was going on on the flank there and you imagine that adjustment is, is essentially near completed until the next such thing occurs here. All right, and here's a view of Mauna Loa today. Still some snow up there. I guess I'm moving across the sky here. And it's really quite quiet up there, right? But while we're up there, um, we're gonna touch on today's Volcano Watch article, which has been posted to hawaiitracker.com if you can go check it out there. And this is something we've covered before, um, but it's great to see the Volcano Watch on deciphering explosive behavior at Mauna Loa. So all different kinds of, of uh, explosive, of, of kinds of lava have been exploded out of there, right? And so they can um, characterize the distribution, the size, quantity, all those kind, kinds of things. And here's a map zoomed in really close on the summit. This is um, way in on the summit. Here's South Pit. I scroll up there is a north pit so really in a, in the zone near the cabin um in a national park here in the south rim very very small area very very small part of this caldera rim on the south has these explosive blocks and then there's two zones on the northern rim one that's kind of more on, on a on north by the summit and then one that's we'll, that's called more of the west the western zone right through here so some interesting differences in kinds of rocks that you, 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 that you see there. Um, a lot of frozen lava lakes from Mauna Loa Summit got, got blasted out of there. A lot of ash and other stuff as well. So go check that out there um, if you would like to see more on that. Um, they do here at the end um, note that no one lives at the summit, but those eruptions could be a threat to hikers, aircraft, and communities downwind that could experience so this is not, not something people should be worried about living on Mauna Loa um, because it's not like a, any of these blocks is going to land anywhere near you unless you happen to be hiking up there when it's, when it's going off. That's this week's Volcano Watch. And because we have some um, changing activity, we're going to um, round, round off here with the webcams. Um, but first, just a little update on what we're doing next week is continuing and um, wrapping up the rest of Volcano Awareness Month. This week we've had 
a gas update on Tuesday. We've had a Mauna Loa story map online on Wednesday and a short feature of recovery events um, released today. And we'll have three more next week, and then next week, Thursday, we'll recap all these two weeks of the review like we did last week for you guys. A little bit less of the monitoring action. So there's data that's uh, new and changing. So that is coming up next week. So we'll last look ins, and let me make sure I refresh my page here to look in on a t KW camera and see the dark edges here at the edge of the lava pond. So the lava level certainly is dropping there. You see that single stream coming in. That's ongoing. And another camera. Oh, here it is. Lost my Go on here to the USGS. Scroll down. There is our F1 camera. This fan camera. All right. I think we are ready for our thank yous, Dane, and any other questions. Um, you are muted. Yep, the, the mic didn't unmute when I hit the button. Um, all right, so I uh, want to thank everybody that tuned in today. We do rely on the viewers to help drive the not only the channel, but the, in the growth of the channel through the comments, likes, and subscriptions and all that stuff. That really helps the algorithm, but also through the support at whitetracker.com and the monetary support that comes through there as well. Uh, we do have a couple sponsors I want to acknowledge, as always, Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa and their new location out in Orchid Land. They got two unique menus, indoor-outdoor dining options. The, the, the one in Orchid Land, it's kind of like an outdoor dining hybrid, so it's, you know, it's great. Um, they got some unique uh, twists on some local dishes with some, uh, you know, a little bit of flair to it. Uh, great for... The takeout options, uh, definitely check out Kaleo's if you're out in Puna or visiting the area, as well as just, you know, taking the family out for a nice bite to eat. Uh, definitely Kaleo's is the spot. And we also want to thank Kalani Tours. They do a variety of different tours, but right now it's as long as that volcano is going and that uh, you can get those, they get that timing just right to be up there when the lava is coming out of the ground. It really is something special. So those lava tours that they're doing up there, Kalani Tours, uh, does more small tour groups so you can get your questions answered get that personalized experience definitely recommend them so we thank our sponsors uh, there as well uh, we do have a couple questions here for you um, we did knock out some of the questions during the broadcast so we have a couple more here um, Joseph asks if this we and you kind of touched upon this too but uh, Joseph asks is this uh, a long-term trend of pauses or is the eruption winding down is is there a history of that happening before like this, yeah, this, this it's, it's cycle it's certain, that we're in yeah i mean so i mean we've we we saw in last week's presentation that uh a, a geologist uh said she would not be surprised if any one of these pauses is the last activity until the next eruption okay that it could have a longer break essentially would not be surprising. That's you know, kind of one side of the co side of the coin. Um, the other side of the coin is that graph I showed at the very start. I'll put it back up here again. Is like the rate of it, right? The rate that we're seeing now is actually pretty pretty high, right? And we, despite all those pauses, and so that would indicate to me um, that it's not about to end, right? And um, we discussed a little bit also how when we had a 2008 to 18 lava lake. And Lava Lake was was mirroring the tilt of the ground as well. It was an open conduit feeding into below of that lake that was mirroring that pressure and um, perhaps becoming an active Lava Lake from being a passive one that was just feeding from above and falling in. So that's a fascinating thing as well, right? Um, could there could there be you know one question I have you know if I can throw a question of my own out there right? You know, could mm -hmm. there be during these pauses? Um, Lava still trickling in and underneath that crust, um, where we don't see any surface effects, but there's something happening down there. I don't, I don't know. We don't. We're not seeing. I the... think it is. I mean, to me, it looks like it just my layman's approach to it is it, it 
that cap is has play in it, right? That moving that cap up that it's created for itself. So it, it would, in my mind, it builds until it reaches an equilibrium and then we start going again. Uh, something along those lines. It'd be yeah. a gas pressurization. I'm not sure what the mechanism exactly there is, but I think that cap has some play um, yeah, in this whole thing. Some capacity, right? So like, you know, if, if it, it could be coming out a little bit and you might not see any surface effect, you know, you're, you know the capacity may not, may not be very much. The play may not, may not be very great, but it could be right. enough to accommodate that little, like a little trickle kind of so I don't know. I mean, really, really, because you know, um, you have to imagine that the the ooze-ups we're seeing on, on the crater wall are significant because they're they're doing a lot of this work, right? To actually get the lava all the way to that crater wall, you have to lift the whole crust in between there to ooze it back out. This is what's happening. That's what's right. leading this higher rate. Right? So I mean, between a higher rate, between that mirroring of the, of the pressure, you know, um, I don't I don't know that. Well, you know, I think really that that smaller pond has really become. The nexus of everything mm -hmm. really like that's that's the area that's likely to be active you know and overflowing and you know able to change shapes and all that um right but, and that's... but that reminds me of that pit of 2008 to 18 now that pit yeah it kind of does doesn't it from below yeah yeah as it resembles it and that was where this one really this last unpausing really started to take off at it threw up a little thing out of the cone like a little spatter and then an hour later, just started coming out of that little pond and right. flowing down into and refilling the, the lake that it had created, that little in-cut lake. Right. And it's all, all connected, not, not very far down. So it comes underneath right. that, that, that cone and it will squirt out the cone, but it's also surging in into that pit from below. Yeah. Brenda falls up on that Twin Peaks thing. i um, not exactly sure where it is, but it, there is a trail that looks towards the shore and there is a trail to two peaks and a lot of deep cracks. Assume this is on uh, a lot of deep cracks and stuff. Sounds like Kilauea, um, but I'm not sure of that trail. Yeah, it sounds to me like it could be the there's there's a twin craters, you know, that's on mm. the southwest rift zone, right? Yeah. Um, and they they have potentially little, they have little cones next to them, so something could be like the that. Twin peaks, right? You know, and so the southwest west rift, and you know, that's the area that you there's a great crack. Famous great crack and it's along the southwest rift, right? That's that surface surface expression of the south south uh, south flank moving. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, um, I don't have I haven't I don't have any direct evidence there, but um, we've seen the south flank continue to be active. I guess is my my default answer there, right? John so, Darson thinks we're talking Mauna Iki. Yeah, southwest rift. Yeah, yeah. Mauna Iki, the twin twin craters. Yeah, Mahalo John. All right, all right. Well, yeah, then. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I think that does it for our questions today. Do you have anything else you want to go over? Um, no, I mean, I think, that, I think yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, we, uh, um, I see I see. there's one question about, about Pahala, but we've, dis we've discussed that before. We'll probably, maybe we can right. do it again. Um, I think I might have got that one in chat. I'm not sure. Yeah, the okay. the hotspot one is, there is a question about uh, how, how big do you think is the hotspot? Is it in terms of dimensions um well it's, is it it's all how you define big... it right like right you know, like it was an extra hot extra hot and hotter than you'd expect mm -hmm. being down on the ground you know um so i mean it's the it's conduit a for magma subjective. maybe the way i think of it is it feeds mauna loa kilauea and loihi all three of those volcanoes so mm -hmm. it's some some area smaller than than a circle that includes all three of those summits right but that's a zone of influence, and that really is what matters, you know, um, to me, right? And whether it's one single pathway or multiple ones, and it has little branches or what have you, um, it's it's all that's happening within that zone between Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and Loa. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, for everybody that uh, enjoyed this, we next week we will be coming back and we'll be reviewing once again the new uh, Volcano Awareness Month videos that have been released since our last review. So we'll have a couple videos to go over and give a quick update as well. All right. Yeah. Mahalo, Dane. So yeah, until next week, you guys, mahalo once again for support. Thank you guys who uh, donated, who liked, shared, subscribed. If you haven't still got a chance and until next week, uh, we're a white tracker. Andy Pont. I'm Philip Ong. <laughs>